The title Non Permanent Address shares its acronym NPA with the subject of the film, which is the New People's Army. And it's a joke among the members, the Red Fighters of the New People's Army, that they have no permanent address because they are guerrillas and peripatetic. They're moving every day, um, sleeping in hammocks or on the ground in the woods. And it's this kind of way of joking about what really is their homelessness. Um, and for me, it's also symbolic of of Marxism and communism, which is the other subject of this film. You know, they embody uh, the persistence of communism beyond its death that we hear so much about with the fall of the Soviet Union or the corruption of communist China. That Marxism is somehow passed along with the twentieth with the twentieth century, and no permanent address is a testament to its. Um, continued existence, and even though it has moved from, you know, a huge state of the USSR or of China to again being um, a hot battle in uh, a tropical jungle or or or, um, or tropical landscape, it still exists. Um, even though you can't necessarily locate it, it's in trying to find it that you realize that it will be everywhere and nowhere. So that's why it's called a permanent address. I not only chose to show the film, but I was, the film was conceived as always being a three screen work. Um, and it's as much as an installation as it is a film. And as an installed video, it, um, it has this surrounding um, feel. So there's this hyper real feel. Your, your peripheral vision is totally, um, is totally encompassed with the screens, um, which sometimes are synchronized and showing the, or they're always synchronized, but sometimes they're showing the same shot in sync on three different screens. And often they're showing same shots slightly desynchronized. So um, it it um, induces a sort of rhythm as well in, in both visual vectors and movement, but um, time and sound as well. Sometimes I build a scene out of using three screens, so there will be a slight fiction, which um, is often used in editing a single screen work, but I build it out spatially. So um, I'll have three different shots, maybe a close up, a medium shot, um, and a wide shot on three different screens. So it seems like there's one scene at one time, even though there are three different times through the shooting process because I only had one camera and was shooting only myself. So it's basically spatializing um, editing techniques and showing the scenes, whereas usually it's kind of a more fictional editing where there's this lie of um, linear temporal progression. So those are the aesthetic reasons um, for, for using three screens. Um, it builds a visual rhythm, it's kind of encompassing, but also the, it points towards a fragmented, a fragmented reality as well. It's not only the fragmented narrative or the fragmented time, but also a fragmented experience. When I'm building an installation, what I want most is to feel again like I was there. It's this operation of memory, it's a deja vu. And what I realize is that memory is never a straight story, even visually. You don't remember things like that. There are images that combine from different times at one time. It's a dreamlike experience and that, that can be reproduced best if you have also a frag uh, uh, image that is both fragmented and total. So sometimes it's fragmented and sometimes it coalesces and, 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 and synthesizes. So it's both the separation and this um, reconvergence that I'm interested in. I made the video No Permanent Address and the body of photographs along with it. At, in 2010, I lived with two squads of, of New People's Army guerrillas for about eight weeks. 
and um, got to know them quite well. One of my techniques is to become intimate with my, my subjects before um, I start filming. So I have a sense of trust and also I know what it is I, um, I want them to, I want to hear from them or what, what, what it is I want to ask them. Um, so I was very devastated to find out last year in 2012, um, in April and June, there were a series of ambushes and attacks from the Philippine military where um, my friends were killed mostly, maybe all. And there's confusion about who exactly was killed because not only were they massacred but also mutilated, um, many beyond recognition. So. We know um, for sure some of their identities and some we don't. Um, it's also, for me, unsure exactly who among them, even though we have a list of names, since they all use pseudonyms or gnomes de guerre, it's unsure, it's hard to match the names with, with, um, with the faces. And I was actually asked to do that because my photographs and, and video are among the only records we have of many of these people. Um, and I was really struggling with that. I want to make a, a work that dealt with that, memorializing them, but also um, dealing with the struggle of representability of, of what it was that happened to them and at the same time what they stood for. In many ways, the video itself and the permanent address and the photographs themselves are already memorials because they're, they're um, images of um, valor of dead soldiers, but um, there's also their very death and massacre itself for me is, is unrepresentable. And to deal with that unrepresentability, I looked at um, some of the images I already had and there was a piece of footage that I really loved that I didn't use in the, the three screen video because there was no place for it. And it was the last video I had taken of them um, the night before I left. I left in the morning. And it was at the last video, they were having a, a secret meeting to discuss their defense because they were anticipating, an, anticipating an attack in the morning, which is why I left in the morning because they thought it was too dangerous for me. And I was filming as night fell. And so the last film I have is at the period of dusk. So sun, the sun has set and it's getting progressively darker. And I didn't have lights. I only had this um, video camera where I kept increasing the gain, which is the way that you make the camera more sensitive to light. And in so doing, the noise or the grain of the video becomes more and more um, pronounced. Um, and it just gets darker and darker over the, a period of five minutes. And the grain dissolves into um, red, green, and blue pixels, which become bigger and bigger. And it's an abs uh, abstraction that's also a technical li limitation. It's an unintentional abstraction, but in looking at it, it's quite beautiful for me um, that it goes from a representation to and dissolves into abstraction and darkness. And also, the camera can't reproduce exactly black, and neither can the projectors, but it can reproduce these red, green, and blue pixels. Um, and red, green, blue is a uh, kind of video format or, or a way of uh, videos uh, recognizes color. And so I called it red, green, blue to kind of point to that formalism and that unrepresentability. Um, I was also interested in how it mirrored in a certain way uh, Mondrian's progression from representative paintings through the plus and minus stage into his compositions in red, yellow, and blue. And I really love Montreal, and, and I liked how that um, movement in his painting and theory was um, recapitulated in a video process. So that's one of the three um, as aspects of the work, this video. I also include a text, textual component on the wall in which I reproduce um, uh, articles from the Communist Party newspaper, which were emailed to me, which was how I was notified of the comrades' deaths. And then, as well, one of the photographs 
I use as a slide projection. And that photograph is one of the only landscape photographs I took while I was there. And it's again about the unrepresent unrepresentability of light and dark, um, because I shot directly into the sun, and so it's kind of blown out and overexposed. And I was trying, looking for the horizon, but the thing about um, being a guerrilla or living with guerrillas is you can never look out into the horizon because if you can see the horizon, if you can see beyond the trees, that means that the military outlooks could also see you and you might be spotted. So in the video, it was a very difficult shooting situation in the photographs that everything has to be close up and there are immediately trees behind the subjects. So this was one of the very searching photographs, kind of looking for something beyond. And so the sun is kind of filtering through the trees and is quite bright. And it always struck me as a very optimistic photograph and quite haunting as well, because what I'm trying to do with the video is to show that, you know, these people are unrepresented and unrepresentable unrep because they're always hiding. They are what are behind the trees. Even if you have a landscape, there's something lurking behind. And um, so that's implied in the photograph as well as their, their optimism, which, which is, which is their idealism, which is their politics. I, we used to joke among us um, when I would tell them that they're being very optimistic and they said, well, communism is optimism. And I thought that was interesting. You know, for them, it's not a matter of political ideology or, or theory. It's, um, it's an aspect of believing in that society should be structured around generosity. So with these three different um, components, I made a something of a memorial called Red, Green, Blue. And that ties together the video, the photograph, and these unfortunate more recent events.